Um, can I thank Tullus Matson and all at Stallions AI Services for giving up their time tonight and organising this. Um, Suffolk Horse Society has had to come to terms with technology fairly fast this year. And I think what we're going to hear tonight is a, a wonderful overview of what technology and advances are made. And before I hand over to Tullis, if I could ask just a bit of housekeeping, if you were all able to mute your microphones, I'd be very grateful. Um, also, questions, Tullis would love to hear questions right the way through. If you could text them through, or what, what's the correct term? Um, if you could chat them through at the bottom. Um, Steph and Faye will pass them over to Tullis. Um, and there will be a question and answer service, um, our question and answer session at the end of the evening. But with no further ado, thank you, Talis, and I'll hand over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for giving us this opportunity tonight to show you around at Stallion AI Services. Um, I must admit, I, you know, I'm sort of coming into having these lovely, amazing animals coming into our our facilities over the years and I really have grown to, to love the Suffolk Punch and, and all it stands for. So um, tonight we're going to show you around the facilities. Um, some of you out there, have, hopefully quite a few out there have got stallions and really want to try and allay your fears about sending your precious uh, animal away to a place like ours and, and just show you the care and how they're going to be looked after because and, and so we're going to show you the process, we're going to show you the stables uh, and uh, how we look after them. And then we're going to do a live collection tonight. So what possibly could go wrong? <laughs> so we're, we're going to do that. Then we're going to go into the lab and uh, then we're going to um, just show you how we roughly process the seam and how we fill the straws. As Mark was saying, get those questions coming in on the chat so I can ask them as we, as we go. Uh, and then we're going to nip upstairs and I've got a presentation showing all these new technologies that are out there. I admit some of them might be far reaching, but they're there to help and they're there to help breeds, especially endangered breeds. And yes, we're at the cutting edge of some of these technologies, but uh, it, we've shown proof of concept on some of them already. So we've got a new few ones that we can show you tonight. So stick with us at the end. One sort of incentive tonight, we are going to pick uh, one lucky winner tonight. We're going to big prize tonight. We're going to give away some sperm key rings and sperm pens, a bit of merchandise, and even one of our neckers. Uh, Etienne's got one on, but you can't see that tonight. So uh, it's covert friendly as well. So when you, when you go out, so yeah, we'll pick, uh, Steph will pick one lucky winner at the end of the night. So uh, it's great that you're all on board and um, get those questions coming on. But anyway, so come on down. We, we've opened up this facility about, about three years ago uh, and we've vested. And believe it or not, we did actually have the heavy horse in mind. With that, I'll go straight into one of these stables, actually. And uh, when we built these stables, we actually built them in mind. So we've gone up, I don't know the measurements, but it's a long way. So we couldn't get stallions touching noses over the top. To be fair, it's when the shires come in at their old place. So we've actually built it, these stables in mind for the, for the, bigger, the, the bigger horse. We've made them... Uh, really nice and big as well. So don't think they're going to come in some small little box. You know, these boxes are 15 foot by 15. So um, they are nice and spacious. So, you know, and we've got the rubber matting. So it's five, I like to think it's a five star treatment. It's like going to a spa for a few few weeks. Uh, so it's not all just about the big boys. Well, we have these little chaps here to, as well tonight. So we've got this uh, little, wet, well, section A, he's coming in. So this barn is... Um, is, is the, the export barn. So all these stallions in for export. Uh, and I'm not too sure where his is going. So I think it's off to, off to Australia, I think. Um, but yeah, a cute little chap there. So we have a real mixture and diverse breeds here, but obviously tonight's all about the Suffolk uh, and, uh, and we're gonna sort of lie all the way back to them as well. Um, this, this is one of our stallions. It's uh, a little bit dirty, but it's one of our most popular stallions, this chap. Uh, this is your Tem Flamenco. He's a show jumping stallion. Um, this this chap's quite an interesting character. We're going to talk about. This is actually a cloned <laughs> horse. So this is a clone uh, called Murkish Gem. Uh, he's he's, he's uh, of a cloned horse called Gem Twist, who was a who was a, a show jumper, who was a gelding, and obviously couldn't breed. So 
they decided to have a couple of uh, clones of him. And this is one of them. He's doing actually very, very well in his own right with the semen as well. So, um, uh, yeah, oh, he's not with us anymore, but this is big star. He went home this week. So a few of you may have known him. Uh, he's one of the gold medal ones. So that's just, this is the one barn. So we have two barns, one for uh, um, the export side and one for the domestic side. Hopefully it's not too dark. I'm going to quickly whiz you outside because I just want to show uh, what we look, how we look after the stallions and what we do on a daily routine. So I don't know whether you can see all this, but we do have a walker. I appreciate a lot of the stuff that heavy horses might not want to go on the walker, but we've got some lovely paddocks. I don't know where you can pan around the paddock. So we, we try the stallions out every day if we can. So they go out for an hour a day if possible, at least. A bit of daily. Longer. Um, and we've got high fence paddocks as well that we'll see, see in a second. So when we're looking after stallions, uh, the, the semen quality side, it doesn't start in the lab. It actually starts, the production sperm takes 56 days. So we have to go right back and it's how they're looked after during that period of production of sperm. So if the stallion's not happy, it actually has an effect on the semen quality. So we can get them nice and relaxed. Uh, and I didn't point out all the boxes have got CCTV in as well, so we can keep an eye on them. Uh, got some. Uh, I see, we've got a good few viewers tonight. I see. I think Bruce, you're, you're there tonight. Yep. Uh, which is great to have you on board, um, Andrew. Andrew has been watching one of every single one of our webinars ever since we started, which is which has been great. Back down south. So, um, so one of the things we do. Also, I think I saw it seeing in that video. Fantastic video, by the way. Um, is that so they weigh about a ton. So we actually weigh these. Uh, I'm not going to jump on it tonight. I don't, put on a bit over the summer so I don't want to show that off but uh, we weigh the stallions three three times a week so if you are worried about the stallions uh, losing weight or putting on weight it can go either way we can weigh them and if there's there's few things that I say absolutely integral for us looking after stallions and one of them is actually the weigh bridge because when you see the weight dropping off a horse or going on it's virtually too late so we weigh them and we can keep an eye on them on that way so right oh we've got one boy that goes out at night and in the high fence paddock you can see over there so coming around this is the uh, domestic barn this is um, the other things that we can do here i said it's a bit like a spa it's like a five-star hotel check this out here so we can actually uh, we can get them under the lights and so actually the, the real Can just jump straight on the mare. Uh, some teasing muscles they're not really used to. So we actually put them under lights, especially the older ones, and they can actually warm the muscles up before we actually do the collection. So it's more in the winter time we tend to use this just to get the stallions uh, warmed up uh, as well. And then we have a, a wash down box if, if, if needed. So this is the other barn, um, and how they're looked after. Um, so this is all the domestic barns. All we categorize these barns. So uh, they have all their own head collars and everything, so we can't get anything mixed up. And we color coordinate everything as well in the barn, so we cannot get anything mixed up from, from, from horse to horse. So it might be just a mix. Yeah, so this one's a bit better. You can see all the blue. So this, this is the blue barn, so the, the coats that we wear for the stallions are blue, and whereas the other barn is red, so we keep them totally, totally separate uh, on that side of it. Uh, we've got all plastic, so it's easier for, to, to wash off. Um, disease is our biggest worry. It's one, well, two things keeping weight. One is paying the mortgage off from this place, but also uh, it's, uh, it's actually biosecurity. Now, we're living in a world at the moment, as we know, with, with biosecurity risks, not just ourselves, but obviously for the animals. So it's something we've had the equine flu uh, outbreak. We've had an EVA outbreak. So... It's something that we really have to be mindful. So all stallions before they come to us have to be tested for EVA and EIA. So, um, right, this is our, this is the awesome, this is, two stallions here, by the way. We've got, we've got, we've got, we've got uh, just in case anybody recognise, this is quite famous, Josh, now. He was in the Horse and Hound last week. As, he was called the Seaman Collector. I mean, what a title that is to have. So, this, <laughs> So this is Josh's own stallion, uh, actually. What's he called, Josh? Clips. 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 Yes. Clips. And what 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 breed is he, Josh? He's a PRE, so he's a purebred Andalusian. 
Well, we couldn't quite get a Suffolk here tonight, but we got the right colour, I think. So well, that's as close as we're going to get it. It's obviously get the, get the, we've got the colour right. We're, we're fairly close. Um, so um, we're, we're going to bandage you up. So if you want to tap on and bandage them out. So before, before we collect off the stallions, um, I'm not saying we necessarily do it to all the Suffolks, but a lot of the stallions, we actually bandage the, the knees and the legs up. Um, and this just, some stallions rub the inside of the legs when they, when they jump on the dummy. So we just actually uh, just protect them uh, the way that we go. So it's literally, generally on some of them, we bandage them all round. And this just gives them a little bit more, I say, protection during the collection. Um, and we'll go into the collection area in a minute. Now, how long have you had this horse, Josh? I've had it six years now. Six years, yeah. So if you ever get a chart, I don't know whether any of you got the horse and hound, uh, but you just want to look on the page but Josh is not talking about semen collecting. If you haven't read it, if you want to laugh and you're feeling a bit down, read it. I'm amazed how, why they, how they even printed it because it's a bit risque, I must admit. <laughs> In fact, I'm not even going to talk about it tonight. <laughs> some of them are a bit risque. So. Uh, right, are you ready to bring him around? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah we'll meet you down. See you yeah, there. We'll meet you there. Right. See you there, guys. So, I hope, uh, hope that he's okay to perform at this time of night. Um, getting a bit light for him. Talk about Clippy now. <laughs> um, right, so it's just a short walk uh, to the collection area. Um, and the collection area we sort of set up uh, really in mind. I mean, I've been doing AI now for about 30 odd years. We've had over sort of 1,200 stallions through here. And we built this three years ago. I must admit, if I built it 10 years ago, I most probably certainly wouldn't have the foresight to how we're going to build it today. So this is our collection area. Um, and we've made it trying to really put safety in mind, you know, obviously for ourselves who are working around these horses, but also for, you know, the animals themselves. As we, we are going to do a live collection tonight. So, uh, yeah, if anything's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong when it's live. But anyway, we'll just have to see how we go. Um, and we've got a teaser mare in, in there as well. So we've set this, this, this hole up with the padded walls. We've even got... A, uh, a sort of a, a cushioned floor here so we actually uh, when if we do have to jump on a, on a mare we can actually uh, stand on it uh, right we might have just go over here so, yeah come on in yeah. you better step out of the way a little bit you were talking about all your health and safety before with the things. We've got to make sure we're health and safety compliant as well. Faye, if you want to jump in here. Can you still see what's going on, Josh? I mean, Etienne? Yeah. Right. So, I'll talk a little bit quieter, but you should get me. So, basically, we've got a teaser mare around the corner. Uh, and all we do is, uh, is we tease the stallion up just to try and stimulate it. Now, all stallion, we'll talk a bit about training on the dummy and all that side in a minute. <laughs> So we're literally just stimulating the stallion at the moment, just so uh, we get his penis to draw out uh, with, with this season. <laughs> Hope he's not camera shy. Oh. Should you turning around? Or should I? So the, the teasing process it varies on the stallion. Uh, this can take. minutes right so, so we actually wash the stallion off before every collection of uh, contamination so most stallions actually take to it you think you're going to get kicked into next week but we did a bit of research into we have a student here and we realized it removes 80 percent of the bacteria uh, that goes into the scene so we wash them off really really well it's really important if any of you out there actually doing this yourself don't use any detergents or anything like that it's just clean lukewarm water we don't want to lose the stallion's own natural flora on the, on the penis as well. Either. So it's literally dabbed off because obviously water could be a contaminant. Um, and <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. There you go. <laughs> Let her out now. It's nice and clean, Josh. 
So the teasing part is important. Some so obviously want to get the stands cut the first time. <laughs> that's uh, one very proud father there. I don't know whether that's uh... Anyway, thank you, Josh. Uh, so you can see how simple the process is. We'll go through a bit more about the collection because that all happened very quickly. Um, but um, yeah, well, thank you for that, Josh. He was the absolute star. Thank you, Clippy. Thank you, Clippy. Yes, I should, should say we feel like a round of applause. I don't know if that's appropriate or not. So, in all this, we're just going to, do you want to bring, uh, yeah, yeah, hang on, just hold it there, two seconds, we'll come down to the side, that's it. Um, so, uh, we need a good teaser mare uh, quite often, and what better teaser mare can we use is uh, this uh, So, we actually, we do have a Suffolk Punch teaser mare, a bit of a sad story, really, with this teaser mare. Uh, she's had, I think she had six falls, and she had four, unfortunately, uh, Pass away uh, either before before folding. So um, she was she was in the end. She was no good as a brood mare, but she's been absolutely brilliant, and I really do mean this. She's been amazing as a teaser mare. So one of the things I want to be rest assured: some of these horses you're saying are, are, are nearly a ton, and she's great to have here because when we get these heavy horses here, she really will stand obviously for the stallions. No matter when she is, she's always uh, will stand for them. She's absolutely brilliant for those nervous stallions those ones that are shy breeders we have a lot of stallions coming in that just doesn't want to go anywhere near the mare to start with so so uh, she's been absolutely brilliant i must admit we are absolutely falling in love with her. she's got her own character but she's absolutely brilliant thanks very much and give you a couple away uh, so we needed quite often i see when the stallions first come to us uh, we actually, some of them have never been collected from, some of them have never been collected from before either, although they covered mares naturally. And so we've got to teach them and learn the process. And that's, a, I'd like to think, a skill that we've learned over. We've done something like uh, 56 different breeds uh, that have been here. Uh, and I have to say, the Suffolk's such wood generally are very good. The beauty about them, most of the time, their libido is pretty good. So we usually jump. First time is we jump them on the mare just to get used to the AV, the artificial vagina. Uh, and then uh, we, will, we will quite often jump, jump on the dummy mare. And a lot of you think, how on earth do you get a, a, a stadia on here? But actually, again, it's, it does seem to be different with the breeds. We tend to, not always, not all of them, but most of the suffolks we find will, will jump the dummy. So it's just about a bit of training. So what we do the first day, we jump on the mare. The second day we bring them in here, they used to say, oh, something quite nice went on here yesterday. And uh, amazingly, it always amazes me, they look at this, maybe we should, we should change it to chestnuts, so <laughs> make them feel at home. Uh, but um, they, they jump straight on. So, um, but not all of them, but if they don't, we have got a teaser there on that side of it. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, no. uh, so the other side, I think, remember do. Bottom of your thing, do the chat. Please ask some questions. Um, breaks my, you don't want to listen, breaks my monotony stuff a little bit as well. So get any questions coming through. So we have this board here as well, so we can keep an eye on the stallion that's coming in, so we know what they're doing. So you can see down here, can you show this, Etienne, a bit closer? So we blanked out the stallions for obvious reasons, but you see the type of collections we do. So this one's on the mare, we can see, see here, this one's on the mare, but most of them, are going on the dummy and then we put how high the dummy's got to go so this has got to go plus three plus three sometimes you saw we needed a pusher tonight for that one stallion some need no pushers as this one and some need actually two so this one must lean across a bit and some stallions we collect on the opposite side so it doesn't always collect on the on the near side so and the type of av that we're going to use and also the libido so it's marked one to five uh, three being a little bit uh, is, is, is pretty good. Two being slow, one being very, very slow. Uh, we've got, and uh, uh, so uh, we've got a one down here, actually. 
uh, and a two and four. And so five of their after raging ball would be coming in just to fly at the dummy. And then we, 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 we have different things, uh, comments about them as well. Uh, so we know what, what their preferences are. Right, let's see what he's given us. Hopefully I've got a collection after all that. It's kind of embarrassing, but where's our AVs gone? Sorry? No, the, the large ones. Uh, and the top drawer. Hmm? Top one, so. Ah, right. So, put them away. so these are uh, ABs. So we have uh, the medium size, but also we do have different types of uh, ABs for the for the for the larger boys. And uh, we don't tend to use this one obviously on the Suffolk's, but for the smaller ones. So we can cater for obviously all the different types of stallions that actually come here. So this is the, what we call this, the dirty room or the, where we prepare, prepare the artificial vaginas. So when we've done our collection, normally we process this an awful lot quicker. Uh, obviously, we'd, as soon as we've done the collection, we bring it in. Uh, we have a filter on here, so we just take this off. And throw that away. And that, again, filters the semen prior to going in. So, right, we're just going to go into the lab now. So. We've had a question come into this. Yeah. From Jules Turner. Oh, Jules. What's, um, what's the ideal age for a colt to start semen collection? That, and does the semen usually freeze well? That is a very good question, especially when it comes to the Suffolk Punch. So what age? So let's come into the lab and let's ask, ask that. Right, let's bring that in here. So this is the, the laboratory. So the age, now the age is, is we start with some horses at two year olds and it does depend on the breed a lot of the time. Um, we do find with the Suffolk's uh, that it's better they're slightly maturer because they take longer to mature. So really we like ideally the ages for most other species start about three, but we can do three year old Suffolk's, but I think if it doesn't work, we'd certainly turn around and say, it's best to bring them in as a four or five year old because they're slightly slow maturers and you see generally with the sort of the, the more the, the, the Welsh cobs and, and that side of it where slightly more faster maturing ones. Was that the whole question, was it? Yeah, um, just the age. Yeah, and does the semen freeze well? So the, the, the freezing well is an open book. So um, some freeze amazingly and some obviously don't freeze at all. And we're gonna to touch on this a bit up, upstairs um, so it does start, it is stallion variants and we know with the inbreeding, we're going to talk about this, this can have an issue on fertility. It's called, it's, it's, a, it's the inbreeding coefficient. So um, yes, some they freeze very, very well and others they don't. I'd say if you look at the breed in general, no, they don't. If you look at the percentages, their percentages are slightly down on maybe some of the other breeds. Um, so we look, we should be able to freeze about 90% of, of stallions with good five or see what come through here. And that may well drop down by 15, uh, about 15% with the Suffolk's because uh, their seam quality sometimes isn't quite as good. But the Suffolk's have taught us a lot and I've got a lot to owe you a lot for. And that's what I, you know, we really are passionate about our Suffolk's. We're not just saying that because you're not watching tonight, uh, but we just do love that particular horse for, for many, many reasons. They are not only a beautiful animal, they're so placid and, and, and great to work with. But they taught us an awful lot. We've had to up our game. Yes, the semen doesn't always freeze as well as we'd like and it's not as easy. But there's a lot what we've done in this lab to up our scale to make them freeze. So they've actually made us freeze semen in a better way. Anyway, without further ado, we weigh our sample. So if, if, this is the, this is the uh, collection that this stallion uh, gets us. Um, we actually had the most we've ever been given from a stallion is by a Suffolk actually. Uh, they gave us 300 mils, I think once, uh, off a, and that was off a, a Suffolk stallion. And this stallion, little Clippy, is giving us 20 mils. But as you'll see, it's not all about the volume, it's about the, the quantity, and the, uh, about the quality. So we get a little bit of a drop here. And... We put a tiny, we put something called 10 microliters stop on the slide here. Just remember, we are doing a PowerPoint upstairs, which we're gonna go through all these new technologies. We're talking a bit about sex semen, we're talking a bit about tissue banking and, uh, and a few other things about embryo transfer and ICSI. So 
I don't know whether you can home in on that, uh, Etienne, but that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. I must have. Wow. <laughs> Joshua, I'm sure he'd be very proud of his boy if he, if he, if he, if he sort of sees that. So that is a particularly very good sample indeed. So what's the size um, generally um, of the average ejaculate? I was getting worried then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's the size of the ejaculate? Well, we're just going to do a bit of a, um, just going to put a few drops in here, just so we can mix this up a little bit. Um, I, think I, saw, I think I saw Catherine from, and my uncle, Catherine from America, and my uncle from America. So a big hi to them. It's a bit way to say, uh, all the way from America. So, uh, so what's the size of the jacket? So the average a styling gives you is about 50 mils. If we're talking... Uh, you want a few facts and figures. So the average ejaculate is about 50 mils. It does vary. Uh, the concentration varies from 150 to 250 million per mil. Uh, and they roughly give you between 7 and 10 billion sperm per ejaculate. But let's see what he's given us, actually. So what we can do with this is uh, if he's given us 20 mils, we just take a little bit off here. And we've got quite a good way of counting how many sperm cells. So quite often it's not the volume they give you, it's how many sperm cells are in that ejaculate. So you can see his is quite dense on the screen. And we mix it with this solution and we put, a, we put, it, uh, we put it through this cuvette. And this very accurately counts how many millions of sperm there are per mil. So we put another bit on a slide. Let's just see if I can get that going. Let me get a nice little drop. I've got another little gadget that I can show you we've just uh, invested in recently. So put a drop on the slide there. And we put the cover slide on. Right. Wow. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether you can zoom in on that at all, Etienne, that, that figure there. Well, oh, they're not just even over now, Etienne. Yeah. Uh, 738 million sperm cells, uh, Josh Stallion's just given us per mil. When I said before, the average is about 250. So, so we can soon work out. So he gave us 20 mils. We times that by 738. So he's just given us 14 billion sperm cells in that pot. That's, that's, that's pretty impressive. So, yeah. Uh, in theory, that if you were doing that, that could be split um, most probably enough to do about maybe uh, 14 or 15 breeding doses roughly, you know, uh, on that. So um, he could easily do, so the average standing gives you between seven and 10 breeding doses per collection. So we're collecting it and freezing it. That's what roughly they're giving us. He's obviously giving us a bit more tonight, so. Uh, uh, um, we've had a question come in, uh, another question from Gregory. Um, what is the average life of fresh semen and how long do you have before it loses viability for freezing slash chilling? Sorry, I've got, sorry my <laughs> mind was elsewhere. Sorry, can't Gregory. Multitask. I can't, yes, I've got that female genetic to multitask, I'm afraid. So, sorry, say that again, Faye. Sorry. So, um, what is the average life of fresh semen and right. how long do you have before it loses viability for yep. freezing it or chilling it? Yeah, really with anything we're doing with freezing, you've got to do instantaneous. So the question was how quickly with fresh semen. So we want to be doing it straight away. Frozen semen is a totally different ball game to, to the, everything else because you have to have such good quality and you don't want to lose that quality. So fresh semen, if you stick it in the mare, it could last in the mare two or three days sometimes. And with, but it is so stallion dependent. If it's chilled semen, it could last a couple of days, uh, maybe even three days quite happily. Uh, but with frozen semen, we get on and we process it straight away. I've got to show you my new toy. I'm quite excited about this. We've only had this very long. I hope it's going to work now. So, Etienne, you come around here. So this is called, this machine is called a... Uh, CASA system, which stands for computer. Oh, I haven't even done it right, so I just better get it out again. Oh, wait, yeah, that's going to work. That's fine. So, can you show what I'm done here, Etienne? So, this shows us the sperm cell spirit swimming around. It might be a bit too dense, but we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. 
12, the night we want to do that. And we'll try and do about five and we'll start scanning. And this is a pretty cool bit of kit. Um, continue. Uh, and this, this tells us on here that that sperm cells are 94% motile with a progressive of 75%. Uh, so we, we knew it was pretty good. It counted in those five seconds, 1,563 straws. And what it does, it contract the sperm cells. So this really can give us a really accurate picture of how well they're moving. Uh, so in other words, the, the, the turquoise ones here are progressive. Uh, the green ones are motile, and then you can see the slow ones. He doesn't have many of those slow ones. So um, that's just a, another way. So it's a, a bit, it's a machine that tells us how good the semen is. So instead of us looking on the machine on, on there, we thought, yeah, that is pretty good semen. This can actually tell us. And does it correlate totally with fertility? No, it doesn't. But it does give us an idea. So just because it's flying around the screen does not mean it's necessarily going to have really good results. But it's a good start, obviously. Um, generally, yes, it is one of the things. If nothing's moving, obviously, it's not going to get anything involved. But this is a really good machine. It, it, it takes out the human error side of things. So, um, yes, that, that can help. And it gives us quality control. So when we freeze the seam, and hopefully you know it's been through this and it can actually tell you what the result is rather than me picking a figure out by looking on the screen. Although I think sometimes my eyes can tell you a bit about it. Yeah, and we have got another bit of kit here. Um, it's called the eye sperm. I don't know whether any of you have, uh, have seen the eye sperm. But I've had a question actually to show the eye sperm. Oh, really? Yes, All right. right. So the eye sperm works. All right, well, I hope this works now. So. I'll just do a bit on here. Right, let's start with a bit of scene. What is the eye sperm? The eye sperm, oh, sorry, I should talk to you. The eye sperm, sorry, uh, is a, a bit like this. It's a much, obviously, cheaper version, but you can analyse semen on an iPad. So, talk me through what you're doing then. So, so, we actually put a tiny little droplet on a, on a plastic we actually got a little light on here so we put it on here and amazingly I hope it's going to work now look at that we can analyze semen on the screen how about that that's pretty cool so you, you don't need to um, go off and uh, you necessarily use a microscope this can this can do it all for you and um, So this has given us a motility at eighty percent, and obviously this is giving it seventy-five. So it's 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 it works pretty well. This machine costs about forty-five thousand pounds, and this machine costs you fourteen hundred pounds. So yeah, anyway. So but it's a really good tool. It's just another way that we can analyze analyze semen on an iPad. So that just shows the the, the accuracy of that, and that gave it. A concentration there of 82, 81 million, and this one's given it a 72. So they're not exact; they're never going to be exactly the same, but they're there and thereabouts. Yep. Another question. Go back another, to Faye. Another question. We haven't seen Faye. This is Faye tonight. Hi. She's a last question. So what's this question, Faye? Um, do you test for viability as you freeze before you freeze um, the whole sample? Go on. Who, who's asking? Good, good question. Good question from Mark. Mark. Yes. Mark. Mark. Mark Donsworth. Right. Mark. Yeah. I wasn't going to do viability, but I can do viability if you want. Um, so it's a very good point. So anyway, motility is only one side of it. I don't know whether this machine is switched on on here. Oh, yes, it is. So there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to do it. Um, so what we do with viability is just to explain to people what viability is. So we've got motility, but viability is the cell membrane structure, how good it is. And we've got a test um, to making sure that cell membrane is intact. So what we do is exactly the same that we did before. We take a sample of this semen. And then we put it into our little pot again. It's, it's 20 microliters, 25 microliters. But instead of putting this solution in it, because this solution we're counting all the sperm cells, 
you put another solution in it, which just looks and permeates the cell membranes of the ones that are not intact. So we'll do that here now. So we take it up, put this in this machine. We just press one and two. So the whole point about motility and, and when you're freezing is trying to get quality control. Now, I love all my bells and whistles and bits of gadgets in here. And we can look at about 80 to 90% of whether we think it's going to get mares in fall. But at the end of the day, we can't guarantee anything. But so we try and eradicate as many variables as we can. So as long as it moves around the screen, that's a really good start. But it's all about morphology or viability. We're looking at the sperm cells to make sure, yes, they might be swimming, but are they viable to get that um, uh, when it meets the, the oocyte? Are they going to be able to permeate that and get that mare in fall? So this machine can not only tell you the concentration, it can tell you how viable it is. So it might be interested. Uh, it takes a few seconds to, to work out that. Uh, just while we're on here, all the um, stallions are or got cameras on them in the boxes so we can keep an eye on them um, I feel this is really important because again if we see a stallion that's uh, unsettled in the box and we really do we care about them when they're here because if they're, if they're unsettled they are going to produce not such good semen so we need them to settle in as, as quick as we can and even sometimes you know oh, we come back with a result now wow this is <laughs> This is pretty much off the scale, this study. So um, he's come back with a 90% viability. Yeah, we should, we should take a picture of that and give it to Josh. If we go and pin it on his wall, I think he'd be proud of that. So viability and motility correlate very closely together. So in other words, if there's 90% viable, you would hope to be 90%. And that's pretty much, it said it was 94 motility. We very, very, very rarely get stallions that are 94% uh, motile on that. So that's uh, good. So what that does is saying, it looks at the viable sperm cells uh, uh, as well. So that's viability. So hopefully I've answered that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Oh, the other thing that, one of the most important things is we've got our semen sample. How are we doing the time? Pressing on. Our freezing extender. So stallions coming in. Hopefully I'm starting to uh, lay, lay, lay your fears. I'm trying to get it out, the words out. Uh, when they're coming here, they're going to be well looked after. But we've, we've got to, that's one part. And hopefully we do, we get it in here. But we've got to look after the semen as well. And that's an important part as well. So we've, something we created over the years. And we're actually doing a PhD sponsoring a PhD student at Nottingham Trent University. We've uh, got our own, uh, I call it liquid gold, because it's, it's really, really good, this extender for freezing stallions, especially stallions that are trickier to freeze. And we've had to work our game really in the lab to make sure those stallions that are trickier to freeze, that we can freeze them. Uh, and this has um, got a special kind of a cryoprotectant in there, something to protect those sperm cells during the freezing process. It's got egg in there. It's got antibiotics in there. It's got sugars in there. So, you know, we collected off this stallion. We're going to spin, spin the semen down really, really fast. We're going to add this cocktail. We're going to freeze it down to minus 196. We've got to thaw it back out again. And it's got to get a pregnancy. It's incredible how we can get that. So this is, I must admit, this, <laughs> really like, this is what makes me look good sometimes. Just, it's, that's, that's, the, that's the stuff that works really, really well. Um, so, uh, but that's our freezing extender. So that... That's uh, is a big bone. So just to take you on the journey now. Um, so we've collected off the stallion. Uh, we brought it in. We've analyzed it. Yeah, it's, it looks pretty good. The next thing, we've got to print, print, print some straws. Uh, and we use a straw printer. You go down there. Let's print the straws. Stop. So stop there. I don't know whether we can we tune into that. So on the straw, is it going to show us? Let me get a bit closer. Uh, now it's a bit blurry, isn't it? No, not going to do it. Anyway, it does say the Suffolk Court Society on it. That's what it's meant to say. So we print the name of the stallion on here. The other thing was print the date on here. We also now should put the concentration on here so people know when they're using these straws, they know what the concentration is of the sperm cells. And also we put stallion AI services and our license number because we're licensed for export. So we, we put that on there as well. So these are half mil straws, by the way, uh, not like the bovine industry, a quarter mil. 
and we're putting about 150 million sperm cells in each straw, which works out 300 million per mil. Uh, and we usually use six straws per insemination. Uh, so, yeah, question. How long does frozen semen last for once it's been frozen? Good, cool. we'll jump in the gun now. I was going to do that bit in there, but I'll bring on up. Frozen semen pretty much lasts indefinitely. So once it's, it's suspended in animation at minus 196, and it can be there virtually forever. That's the beauty about it. And we're going to talk about that later, freezing down those genetic lines. And, you know, we can freeze them down now. And then they're there for future generations. They can repopulate that certain genetic line in 10, 20, 100, 150 years' time. So that's why cryopreservation is just awesome. It really can freeze this, these things down in time. The next thing we're going to do is we actually can fill these straws. So, uh, Etienne, where do you want to go? Do you want to go over here? Can you get a bit closer? So what this does, it fills the straws. Fills the straws, and then it seals at the at, at the other end. So that's uh, we've done clear straws, so you can see the semen going in there, basically. So um, so that fills. I'm going to say we can get sometimes 60 straws, which is 10 dose, 10 doses, six straws per dose. It depends on obviously stallion and what he gives us on each one. And what we do is when we thaw this out, we want a minimum of 35% motile with a minimum of 45% viability as well. So those are sort of the criteria we look at. Right, let's see where the actual heart of, sometimes the um, phone stops working here. We'll just see how we get on uh, as with this. But uh, so this, that room we've just been in is where all the fresh processing goes on. And uh, this is where all the frozen semen is shipped. And we've got on here uh, different countries we're going to. So we've got, we've got Kenya, New Zealand, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and Canada. So we're getting all those stallions lined up uh, for export. So the beauty about this is we can, uh, in the summer, obviously we're doing the UK stuff, but in the winter we're doing Southern Hemisphere because they're stallions and, and hopefully we're going to send some Suffolk uh, semen off to uh, New Zealand pretty, pretty shortly and we can cross pollinate and swap genetics all over, all over the world. So, right. So let me know. Somebody had to shout if it's not working. So. This is where we do all the storage of the samples. So it's, it's built like a bit like Fort Knox, just these two rooms. God forbid anything would happen to this place, but we've got concrete roofs, uh, steel doors, and this is really where the heart is. This is where all your genetics lies. This is where all the sort of the money is. So we really want to protect these rooms. So every, we've got everything in these room, this room is here for export. So Etienne, can you come around here a little bit? Can you poke, poke the camera? Don't drop my camera in there now. <laughs> So, so in this one vat that we've got here, it's virtually full now. It's got about a quarter of a million straws in this in this one vat itself, and uh, and I say that's can be stored there indefinitely. So um, that's the beauty about liquid nitrogen. So we have four of these big vats: two for uh, export and uh, and two for UK. So this is our sort of freezing machine. So that's where it's all frozen. You okay there, Faye? Yeah, um, so, yeah, they're asking how long it's stored, it's stored for indefinitely. When we're shipping semen out, I don't know whether many of you have seen this, we actually ship the semen out in these what's called dry shippers. So uh, it'll be sent to, and it can be pretty much sent all over the world. These can last up to three weeks. Uh, we had one stuck in Bahrain once for three weeks with £20,000 worth of semen. I, must admit, I think that's where I lost all my hair, I must admit, it was worry. But actually, amazingly, the semen was still okay after that. So. Um, yeah, so these are the, and they're dry shippers, so health and safety now, we can't, you know, we don't really send in, in wet shippers, so we send in dry shippers, and that means it can, it can uh, travel all over the world uh, with that. Right, uh, let's, uh, let's come out here. So, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Right, we're going in, to me, one of the most exciting rooms on the place. If that wasn't exciting enough, uh, well, this, this, this actual room is, uh, yeah, it's a new lab. I have to admit, it's not so much to see in here, uh, but we're going to pop upstairs after this and uh, show you a presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, it follows in here. So, 
So this room uh, I, I'm quite excited about. Obviously, as you know, I, I love the technology side of things and uh, we're always trying to push those boundaries. It, it really makes us focus and think and, and, and you're trying to make sometimes the impossible possible, you know, and, it, and you have a lot with research, you have a lot of downs, but when you do succeed, you, they're great highs. And, and what this, in this room, what we're doing is we're storing tissue down uh, for tissue banking. And um, so we, we actually got a micro manipulator. So in theory, uh, that's used for ICSI. Uh, so we have a flow hood here because everything has to be sterile. So why would we want to freeze tissue samples down? So there can be the sort of the cloning side of things. Uh, so some people want to uh, clone a horse or, or, or on that side or the cats and dogs. Uh, but more importantly, something we're just getting into is, is for the wild animals. And I don't know, sorry, I'm doing a bit of a plug now, I'm afraid. If anybody didn't see the extinction uh, with David Attenborough uh, the other night, I just ask every single one of you, watch it on iPlayer. It just shows which way the world is going. And there is a bit of crossover because, you know, a lot of animals are going extinct. And we've talked about the Suffolk Punch before, you know, how uh, if we don't do something to help them, they could well be disappearing in front of our eyes as well. And they're using these technologies. So in here, we store samples, tissue samples from animals. So we had, uh, we've got elephants in here, we've got uh, cheetahs, we've got the black rhinos, uh, we've got a whole range of different species frozen in time, frozen in ice, in a way that we can regenerate those cells. And I think it's massively exciting uh, what science can do now to stop these species going from extinct. I won't go on about too much because I know it's all about supper tonight, but I just put my. But there's 25,000 species that are going to go extinct in the next three years. There's one million at risk, and we have to find a ways of stopping this. We as a species have made them go extinct. But anyway, so this technology I find absolutely fascinating how we can bring back, in theory, to an animal back to life, literally by a six mil uh, tissue sample biopsy. So anyway, that's, uh, I find it absolutely fascinating on this side. So we can do something to help these species. Right. Um, that is a very quick overview. I hope I haven't missed anything else. Steph, you'll have to tell me if I've missed anything out, but we're going to nip upstairs now um, and uh, we're going to do a presentation. So if we do go blank for a second, um, please bear with us. Um, so you might have to switch off that one. And we're about to switch over. So just bear with us a second while we go from one screen to another. So can we cut this one off? Can we just stop? If 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 you don't, yeah. I'll just leave. Yeah. I could just. Can you give me a thumbs up, Steph, if you can hear me? Ah, brilliant. That's right, I can see you're on. Oh, um, you'll have to let me know whether I've missed anything out on that anyway. So, um, brilliant. God, it looks like we've got, we've got some good, good lot of people here still. I hope we haven't lost too many people uh, on, on the way. Um, so, right, I'm just going to share my screen now. I um, hope this works. Uh, screen two. And then... There we go. Oh, I just have to, I want to see Steph so I can make sure she can see what I, oh, I'll probably share. Haven't I? Uh, can you see that, Steph? Yeah, you can see that. Brilliant. Fantastic. Right. Uh, so keep those uh, questions. Oh, I can see my uncle, Peter. Can you hear me? <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah. When we do these webinars, I normally can't see people in front of me, but see my uncle in Florida. I've I've seen it for ages. Brilliant. That's made my night at us. Um, right. So, um, so yes, we're going to talk about sort of new technologies now and what can help uh, with that side. But before we start, if my, hopefully my cursor will work. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to talk a bit about us. Obviously, we've gone through that already. Um, I've been a be, had the great honor to be a, a trustee of the rare breed survival trust for, for some time some of the services we do here we've gone through that a bit about sexing semen we're going to it's not on there but a little bit about uh, embryo transfer epididymal sperm extraction oocyte recovery 
uh, and a bit about the tissue banking. So it's all these new technologies that are out there um, uh, that, that could play a part in helping save this. I mean, I know the street on the screen isn't that stuff, but these, these amazing breeds. I just want to step back in time. And actually, my uncle's watching, so you might recognize some of these, these pictures. Uh, this is actually his father, uh, my grandfather. And um, I have to admit, I, I don't know whether these, uh, any of these are a Suffolk, they're certainly heavy horses, but this is actually him uh, uh, getting the crops in on the farm right next door to us. So, you know, I feel there is a, a close affinity to these, uh, uh, these amazing breeds. And, you know, everybody's watching tonight, most of you are, know a lot more about Suffolks than I do. Um, but it is been in our heritage, it is in our family heritage. So I do feel a, a sort of duty of care uh, to try and uh, look after these amazing species. And, you know, some people say, you know, crumbs, you know, they're going rare for a reason or something like that. But, you know, as you know, these are the ones that put food on our table many, many years ago. And I really, really do feel there's a responsibility to keep this magnificent breed uh, from, from disappearing away from us. Just a little bit about the farm here. We, we're on a... 360 acre farm uh, we used to have a big dairy farm uh, and about 2,000 2,500 pigs exactly where we're sitting now you can go in the water um, and uh, then in 69 we actually see if I can get the I don't know whether it's going to let me do it now uh, just bear with me a second um, let's see if I can just get my marker up my laser pointer that's better uh, so, you know, we were decimated by the foot and mouth, and this is the few this, where they used to burn all the pigs and everything. So we got hit quite hard by that, and then my grandfather and father built it up again. Um, and, oh yes, this is, uh, so you think, um, I must just, uh, I'll just bring that up, that's better. Uh, so I've got quite a lot, going back, that's the farm, but going back many years ago, this is some very early footage of how they used to collect off a stallion uh, in the 1930s for, for in the, in the, with the German army. They used to let the stallion cover the mare. Um, as you can see, good health. It looks like the postman's just turned up now as well to give him a hand. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's literally washing his hands. And he literally used to go in the mare and, and, and scoop the semen out. Um, and this is one of the first sort of documented ways of actually how to collect semen off them. And there you have it, the, the potter seam. I, please do not try this at home, all right? <laughs> just putting it out there. Um, um, but it was just a, I love these old videos, how we all started. Now, any of you out there thinking you've got a bit of a tough job and you think you're, you've been dealt a, a hard time in life, you just spare a thought for this person. This is one of the first dummy mares out there. Um, so this poor guy, I don't know how much he got paid, but I'm sure it wasn't enough. And I must admit, I'm sure this wasn't built for the Suffolk punch either. So I don't know whether it would take a, a ton of weight coming towards it. But anyway, uh, luckily, times have moved on and we don't have to employ somebody to, oh, I just, every time, I've seen this picture a million times, but it still cracks me up every time. I find it absolutely uh, uh, hilarious. So just going back, a lot of you may or may not know what we do here, but we are, my brother has a stud next door. He does all the... Uh, the embryo transfer, the AIs, the ICSI and that side of it. And he has uh, sort of three or four full-time vets. Uh, so he looks after all the girls. I look after all the boys. And we're literally about 300 metres apart. We are two total separate businesses altogether. So that puts you a bit of a picture of us. Just to show the different businesses that we have here, um, because it is quite confusing. We have one called Gemini Genetics. That sends all the semen around the world. Stallion AI Services. We've got Stanley in Ireland and we've got actually, we've been, we had a canine course here today. Uh, so we're teaching people how to collect and freeze dog semen. And uh, the other business is, is, is Gemini Genetics. That's the tissue banking. And also we have a conference suites up here as well. We were founded in 2000 and we've been DEFRA approved. We've actually been going since 96, but the company was founded in 2000. And we've got, I think this is a bit of an old slide. We've got well over 1200 stallions here now. And we're associated obviously with a rare breed survival trust and uh, the zoological community like Chester Zoo and with Nottingham Trent and Harper Adams. So it's quite good to have them on board. I'm going to go through these slides a bit quick. As you've seen all this, we've done the fresh and chilled and our core services is obviously the freezing. Um, just in case you didn't think we could do a, a Suffolk punch on, on the dummy, I think this is a, a video I, I found. I, 
you must, might tell me which one it is. I don't know, to be fair. Um, um, but uh, they generally take to the dummy mare pretty well. We don't get all of them on the dummy, as I explained before, but most of them um, tend, to, tend to jump the dummy uh, uh, pr pretty well anyway. So, um, but and I think it's a good thing. Sometimes we have three or four Shires or Suffolk's in at one time, and our poor old Diamond, we don't want her jumped on, obviously, every, every day as it is. Now, I, I said to you that, you know, the Suffolk Punch has actually um, taught us a lot in our lab, and it really has. So I, and I, I don't just say this, because I, when I go to other conferences, I do mention it, but we were sort with a bit of a problem with the Suffolk Punch. When we sometimes get uh, the uh, semen into our lab, we found that the semen motility was quite shaky with a lot of the Suffolk's, and uh, so in other words, it's got like a toxicity effect. And we found out the seminal plasma, which is one of the parts of the ejaculate that we get off the, off the stallion, can have a detriment effect to that semen. And we noticed it, we, as soon as we brought it in the lab, we saw it's, it's moving this way. So we thought, how are we gonna get around this? So now we actually, uh, I don't know, we can see here, we put a hole in the bottle and we actually put extender in there, a medium to dilute this semen out. And we do that right across the board now. So we do it on all species and we find it improves the quality of semen only sometimes by a few percent, sometimes by a large percent. And that all became because of the suffer punch, because we found we had to have a different way of processing their semen from other species. But then we put it back to the other species and we found that it works well. So uh, I thank you obviously for, for that, because I think um, just on the exports, the, the world is a small place now. So uh, and as we know, you know, things can be shifted around. And I just want to show you, you know, the level of exports that we're doing now. In 2012, I think we exported to about, I think it was about 10 different countries. We did 23 different countries last year. 2012, it was about uh, £90,000 worth of semen. Last year, we did 4.1 million. And that's not our, obviously, money. That was the, the worth of the semen that's moving around. And we actually... On a good note, because everybody thinks some of the semen, more semen comes into the country and it goes out, we actually export nearly double the amount of semen going out that comes in, which is stands as we all sometimes, I think, gives ourselves a bit of stick about our British breeding. But if we're exporting double them with them coming in, I think it just shows that we've got some fantastic breeds in this country and they're worth exporting all over the world. So um obviously my work with the rare breeds survival trust I, I just love that side of it it's sent us challenges i love the challenging side of it and um you know of the 14 uh, equine breeds 12 are considered rare five of which are critical state which we obviously know that the, the, the suffolk punch is one of them and you know we've been working with the rare breed survival trust obviously for quite some time and and uh they do a lot of work uh as well with, with West Kington as well, where they store some semen as well. Um, so other work we've done is with obviously the Highland ponies. And uh, we actually did some, we do this thing called epididymal sperm extraction, which will come uh, across, uh, tell you a bit more about that in, in, a, in a minute. Um, this now I think is really important to, 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 to see on uh, the sort of the extinction vortex and how this can work. So I, I've got these slides from the, from I did a thing for the Rare Breed Survivor just a while ago. So, um, and people don't really realize what makes a breed go extinct. And I think we've got to understand the fundamental side of that. It is lack of numbers, don't get me wrong, but the lack of numbers is not what finishes them off. It's, it's actually the inbreeding coefficiency. So for the Clydesdale horse, for instance, that's on a 27% inbreeding coefficiency and what happens then is that when you get that inbreeding, well, if you look at mother, uh, brother and sister mating is 25%, it's worse than that. And uh, that can, in the zoo world, they call it the extinction vortex because basically it spirals out of control. And when you get down here, it's very hard to get back up. And it's usually because of the inbreeding, so the inbred, and that's where Andy Dell's done a fantastic job, I must admit, we're using and i think the suffolk course that you're using the spark system already isn't that right mark yeah yeah and uh, i think it's so important i can't tell you how important that is to try and work with this uh, and do what appropriate breeding because if we don't this is what makes them go extinct we see stallions coming in here with smaller testicles 
poorer quality semen, they're harder to get in foal, there's a higher uh, neonatal death on these, on these foals, and it is literally game over. And we think we're doing something right and, and bolstering the breed, but when you get this in breed, I can't tell you, it is great. And this is not just the Suffolk punch, it's not just, we see this in the elephants, we see this in all species. This is what makes breeds go extinct, is the inbreeding coefficiency. And so uh, it's really important. And then if we don't careful, they can literally disappear in front of our eyes and we can't do anything about it because they're too inbred. So that's why we need to store these genetics. And hopefully, this is why I know the Suffolk horse side is working so hard to see, see if we can get some, maybe some stallions in to store those genetic lines. They might not be used in the next few years, but they may well be there for future to actually stop this breed from going disappearing away. Because once you've lost those genetics, you can never re-bring them back unless they're frozen down. Um, but there is a bit of hope. You know, I think we've got to, you know, I say appropriate breeding, uh, tissue banking, freezing semen, um, and, uh, and, you know, really using the spark system. Uh, we can hopefully stop these species from going away. We need ideally at least 50 different genetic uh, lines to really make a breed sustainable. Ideally, we need 500, um, but freezing these samples down in time can really, really help uh, stop them from disappearing. Oh yeah, this video is gonna show you, some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not. I don't know whether you're gonna pick up the volume. I think it's very uh, emotive. Um, and uh, we'll just try and turn the volume up and start it. brand new facilities here, we've built a state-of-the-art laboratory. We've made an extender immediately, we put in the seam and that actually frees it at minus 196 degrees. So in 10, 20, 30 or 40 years time, we can actually repopulate a generation with, with that genetic line. It's amazing how you can bring something back to life that is so cold and then straight away get pregnancies. It's quite amazing. Yeah, I must admit, I must have watched that video oh, I don't know, 30, 40 times and every single time it leaves a lump in my throat. Uh, it really does. It, it's, it's emotional, emotive, and it really tells a story, I, I believe, uh, straight away. So what can we do about it? Um, we talked about the extinction vortex. There's, there is quite a bit. So we're coming on to the, the interesting bit. So please bear with me. We're talking about these new technologies now. And uh, uh, some of them you may know already, uh, some of them may not, so, so please ask away if, if we don't explain it well enough. Um, embryo transfer, um, this is where we can obviously take, a, take an embryo 
out of out of one mare she might not be able to hold it for long periods of time so there might be certain issues uh, and we can put it in another mare and there's various reasons that we want to do the embryo transfer but one of them obviously for your side is the production of foals for genetically valuable mares and this is one way obviously a mare can only have one foal a year um, so uh, beauty about obviously with the stallions they can carry on reproducing with the semen to, to many but the mare can only do one so this is one way we can produce two. This, I believe, I might be wrong, but this, I think, is one of the first ever uh, embryo transfers. I can't remember how many years ago this was, but I know it was a long time ago. So this was the, 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 the donor mare. She put an embryo inside this recipient mare, and then she, had a, she was putting foal herself. So this particular year, obviously, she had two foals. So that's another way. I have to admit, I don't know the sex of these foals. It's a long time ago, um, but these were the actual pictures that were taken at that time so that is obviously embryo transfer again it obviously comes it, these things aren't always cheap to do but it just shows that it can be done and a mare cool i mean she it depends on the mare some people ask how many can they do a season but they can do sometimes three or four it depends on the mare really uh, and how many they can do but most people maybe just do one or two if they're going to do it sexing seam and well We've all seen the headlines this summer, and I must admit, I, I, it was great. And I know I keep coming back to it, but I do thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to do this because I absolutely love this sort of technology. It, it's uh, really fascinating, and it's great for us to, to be able to show it and show it in, it in its right form. So we've been uh, working with a company called Cogen. I presume there's a few farmers out there amongst you, so you most probably know a lot about this sort of sex semen. Uh, cogent have been sexing semen i think since uh well it says on there sorry yeah i should read my own slide shouldn't i since 98 uh and uh that obviously they want want, want female calves uh, um uh, and they've been doing that so we, they've been helping us uh, transfer it across to uh the uh Kate, the equine side so how does it work so the basic the x bearing sperm the female sperm uh I'm sure there's going to be a joke in here somewhere for somebody but it has female sperm has four percent more dna than the male sperm so uh so we can actually or well, they can home in on that so what we do is put a fluorescent dye in that semen and it's the fluorescent dye is going to shine four percent brighter uh the x bearing sperm than the y bearing sperm and it shines brighter we they can home in on that send a laser beam to that uh, brighter sperm so to speak the female sperm and give it a positive or negative charge. If it's got a positive charge uh, and you go past a negative magnet, it's gonna be attracted to opposites attract and it's gonna be a, a go towards that magnet. So, and it's a, it says about here 90% accuracy. We've been actually about 96% accuracy uh, most of the time. So, and this is how it works. And I don't, we can see here. So we put this dye in, I don't think we can see this. I'm showing this laser here. So you can see the differences between these two different shades here that's the x and y sperm cell we turn it around to produce this bottom graph here and we can home in on just a draw a circle around it and all those in theory in that circle 96 percent of them are all x they're all females and that's how it works and these peaks that you see here the better the peak the better the differentiation and this is it goes through every a single drop every about twenty-five thousand sperm cells a second go through this drop really really quickly so it's really quite amazing how it works uh and they then they get separated into the pot the x and y depending on what we want and obviously with the suffolks we're wanting females um last year we started doing this and, the, and our first mayor we got involved and we're putting um, for, with this one, we put 41 million sperm cells. When we're normally, you've got to think, when we're normally AI mare, we might be putting half a billion. So we're only putting 41 million in, so we're cutting that dose down a lot because it takes all day just to do that. And they lend us four of these machines or five of these machines. Each machine is a million pounds each. So it just shows that, I have to say, Cogent have been really brilliant on this. They, they really uh, just do everything at cost for us and really help us out do this because they're really interested in this technology. And then we had our first pregnancy uh, and obviously this summer we had a great success last year I have to admit it's amazing how everything hinges on one pregnancy because we tried one of the Suffolk's a couple of times and we failed on one it wasn't quite right that the timing and everything and uh, I'm not saying I would have thrown the towel in but 
we got down to, it's only on the second attempt. And I have to say with the sex and semen so far, if everything is spot on. In other words, if the semen's good, the mare ovulates at the right time and everything, we get actually very, very good conception rates. And on the second attempt, I think it was in August time, I thought, God, one more go, and amazing. Absolutely incredible, she's pregnant. And this next video um, uh, from, from Steph's, I think son uh, made this video and it just shows you, I think you may have already seen this, but it shows you what's happened. And after 11 months of waiting, um, Ruby has produced a fully foal. Um, and it's not just any old foal. This is a foal born by sex semen. I believe it's the first ever in the world uh, for a rare breed animal to use sex semen. And using these technologies can really help this breed. There's only about 70 rated females left in the country. There's only 300 left in the world. They need all the tools of the industry. And it's just quite incredible now what we can do with science and technologies. And using this technology, maybe, just maybe, we can help stop these breeds from going extinct. But this is called the future. So this is the first steps. Oh, I'm going to be in tears at the end of this night. I must admit, I'm an emotional person anyway. So, uh, But I thought, yeah, I, it, to me, that was just everything we do here. Uh, I just love it. And, you know, some people might sort of say, God, it's far too expensive, you know. And don't get me wrong, it is. It is because, but we've got to start somewhere, I believe. We have to start. If we just said, right, it's too expensive, we're not doing it. You know, technology and science won't move on. So, and I always believe these things will get easier. Uh, these things, these new technologies do get simpler, uh, but we have to start somewhere. And so, you know, it was, it was a, to me, it was, a, it was a great start. So, uh, and it really helped me because it bolsters me think, right, we've got to go further. If that mayor wasn't in fault, in the, yeah, I'm sure we would have carried on. But uh, it was so much effort last year. And it's great to see this amazing little filly uh, now. And I think we've got, an, we've I've got another uh, mayor in fall with sex semen this year uh, as well. So. So where on to next with sex semen? Uh, fresh, G, fresh semen is the, what we've been doing so far. So the next thing we're looking at frozen and we're actually frozen down some already uh, from a Suffolk punch stallion. And um, that has been frozen down for ICSI straw. So we'll talk about ICSI in a minute. And uh, that's totally revolutionary. That might even bring the price down and help a lot because we can bank a load of this uh, sexed uh, uh, um, uh, ICSI straws and that can be used whenever then and it doesn't mean that the quality of the semen doesn't have to be as good which is really good so if a standing semen doesn't freeze very well we can still use it for ICSI so that's our next challenge so hopefully if you invite me back again next year uh, hopefully we'll have a, uh, a a foal born by this but we will see we won't hedge our bets uh, straight away so something else that we're doing is called epididymal sperm extraction I don't know whether any of you had your tea yet, but anyway, I, I, I hope you, you, know, you haven't got a weak stomach. So we've got a few graphic pictures to show now. Um, but I just want to talk to, because a lot of people don't know about epididymal sperm extraction. It's nothing more frustrating than hear from a stallion owner. Oh God, I put my stallion down last week. I didn't realize I could do this. So you can actually send us the testicles in long as they're within about 12 hours and we can actually extract semen from those uh and uh you know and, and and preserve it so we've done quite a few species we've done about well we've done about well over 150 now uh but we take off the epididymal sperm here which we can see and most of it's by uh is elective castration now it takes about four hours it's quite a lengthy procedure uh from start to finish we wash the testicles we clean them up uh, 
and then we get them ready for, for uh, dissection. Uh, they arrive to us chilled uh, in, in, in a box uh, like this. So they just cool down about five degrees. I say we wash them off and we, then we spend quite a while just dissect, dissecting the actual, just the epididymis itself. Uh, and then we extract the seam and we put a, a needle in at the end. We cut one end of it and uh, we can actually just flush. I say just, but it takes a bit more than that, but flush the semen out uh, the other end. You can see the semen dip, dripping out here. And we get sometimes up to 60 doses recovered from this. So it can really, really work, especially in some of these stallions, even with poor quality semen. At this stage, the semen might be okay. So it, it's, it's definitely worth a thought. Uh, if, God forbid, anything happened to a stallion or if they were going to be castrated anyway. Um, this is always interesting. This video on the left, this is what the semen generally looks like uh, before it goes in. So it's totally immotile and it always puts the fear of God into me. Uh, to start with, it's, um, but this is its post store. So we actually add something to the semen to wake it up. We call it SSPR, synthetic seminal plasma replacement. So we add something to, to wake it up because in the epididymis, it's immotile. So uh, we've done a, obviously a few, uh, we, uh, they were going to castrate this, this, this stallion, obviously a rare breed, fell pony. They sent the testicles in, we got 18 doses. So stallions don't necessarily have to come here. Obviously it's, it is a bit final, but just so you know, this process is out there. This is quite a, a, an interesting story. Uh, we, we'd be done a stallion uh, up in Scotland. They sent us the testicles down. And about a week later, the same vet practice, uh, this, this farmer uh, bought this bull at the market for, oh, uh, I think for about 13,000 guineas. And about a week later, it broke his leg. So he went to the vets and said, look, what am I going to do? And he said, I know this guy in Shropshire, he might be able to help you. Well, I've only done equines. I've never done bull's testicles before so great for google Went to google see what we're gonna what comes up uh, well you don't want to know what comes up but anyway I, 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 um, um, uh, anyway we started dissecting it we spoke to cogent they gave no they hadn't really done it and we got this semen out it was about 20 percent. i sent it back up to him i said look if it works i would like my freezer full of aberdeen angus at the end of it anyway it didn't hear anything for years about two or three years and he, I suddenly had this phone call. He said, you're not going to believe this, uh, but we got a calf on the ground by that semen, uh, which we can see this little chap here. So, um, and I was doing a presentation literally uh, last August. And I was, it was quite fun, these slides, and I always put these out. And the guy in the front row pointed to me and said, hey, I sent you those testicles. And I went, oh, right. Uh, he said, you're not going to believe it, but I've got a picture of that calf is now this bull here. Uh, and he's grown to a fine specimen. And they've got over 30 offspring from those epididymal sperms. So it just showed. And I don't know whether it's my highest accolade or not, but we did hit the front page of the sun as well at the same time. But I'm not too sure that's something to be brag about. Or there's obviously no coronavirus or Brexit going on at the same time. So, um, but they used every exclusive under the sun. So that got me thinking, if we can do bull's testicles, and equine, why can't we do other species? I know we're going slightly off piece now, but it's all about preserving rare breeds. So yes, Chester Zoo, we work closely with them. They sent us an Omnigo in, very similar, obviously, uh, to what we've been used to working with. This is the post store. We got 29 uh, doses off it, which is, which is brilliant. A mouse deer, I don't know whether any of you have heard of a mouse deer. It's the smallest deer in the world. It's about the size of a hare, it's tiny, uh, exceptionally rare. Well, if that's going to be tiny, imagine the size of the testicles. They're pretty tiny too. So how do we extract semen from uh, testicles weighing 1.3 of a gram? Yeah, with difficulty. Um, so that's what I enjoy about this site. You know, we send us these challenges, but amazingly, we actually managed to get some semen from this. It wasn't the best quality, but we frozen down. And I think we're hopefully going to be AI. We have, must admit, I have been saying this for about three months. We're waiting for the, the other hair to... Uh, mouse deer to re, uh, get into a cycle but well, hopefully we're going to AI some, some semen from this epididymal in the next three months at Chester Zoo. Uh, there is something else we can do it's not all about the stallion uh, we, there is something called oocyte recovery it, uh, so where you can take if this this mare died she's a Cleveland Bay uh, mare uh, the ovaries were taken out the, the eggs were scraped out of that, that, uh, the, these ovaries, and they're called oocytes or eggs, and eight were recovered from that, that particular mare. And ICSI was performed. This is where 
uh, one sperm cell is injected into to, uh, to, to, to one egg. And this is what we're going to do with this sexed uh, semen as well, uh, um, uh, frozen semen. We're going to do the same, same procedure. And it's quite complicated, but there's a place in uh, Italy that's doing really good. There's a place in, in, in New Zealand that's doing really good. And so those, those eggs were sent off there and uh, they got three embryos and the costs, because people always wonder about the cost, the cost for those three embryos is about £2,000. So to me, it wasn't a too bad a deal on that when you look at it. And maybe this, just maybe, this is maybe the, one of the ways you could go forward. You could use sex semen and it could be a lot, lot cheaper than maybe uh, some of the other methods that we're going. If you want those filly folds, this may be just an avenue to go down is using the ICSI model. This video on the left is, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it, this is um, when we do the ICSI over here, we managed to borrow a time-lapse camera. So you might think this is a human embryo, but actually this is one of the first ever documented cells dividing from a horse embryo. Um, it takes a picture every 20 minutes uh, and uh, then you put the time-lapse together and you can actually see those cells dividing. Uh, and, uh, and, this is, and you can see how well it works then, seeing they're dividing in the right way and the, and the, and the right proportion as well. So it's not just a nice bit of technology. My brother next door, Edward, uh, yeah, he had the uh, an ICSI fold born uh, in 2015 and he's about to start this back up again. It is highly complicated. And I'd say the people in Italy are doing an amazing job and they've really got sewn up. But I'd like to think uh, instead of sending it to Italy, we can do it over here as well. So you, you think it only takes one sperm. This video is going to show you actually it only takes one sperm cell. If it's going to work. seem to work every time don't they but yeah it just takes one doesn't it at the end of the day so that's finished off the ICSI the embryo transfer we're just finishing off now on the Gemini genetics this is actually about the tissue banking um, um, I might think I don't want to lose you if you if we're going on a bit but this is about um, storing tissue samples down we spoke about it downstairs it's preserving viable cells for cell culture and possibly going on for cloning or other purposes as well and yeah we're working uh, with a great lady at Oxford University, Susanna Williams, and she's been working with actually getting ovarian tissue uh, from, uh, from rhinos and being able to produce eggs in a Petri dish. So, you know, it's, again, it doesn't all come back to the stallion side. We can maybe do this. If we can get ovarian tissue from the Suffolk's as well if, if they pass away. And this is just something else we can freeze these tissue samples down. It's really cutting edge, but it is out there. But if we don't freeze these tissue samples down, we have got nothing there to use for the future. We work with a company called Viagen. Uh, they're a real sort of ethically sound a company. And actually, there is, you know, some people on the cloning side, people say, yeah, something I'm not interested in uh, because it's really messing with nature. And I can understand that, you know, but it's learning that this might be the only way that we can stop this, some species from going extinct. So. Freezing those tissue samples down is very, very cheap to freeze it down. It's only about 400 pounds. Yes, the cloning is quite expensive. That can be 70,000 pounds, but that price is dropping all the time. It used to be $200,000 uh, and now it's 70. So, but if you haven't got the tissue samples there, you can never, never be used. Uh, and proof of concept, this is actually only, we can see the 4th of September. This bowl was actually born on the 6th of August. Uh, I can never get the pronunciation right, a Brzezowski horse uh, used from DNA. And this is really everything I've spoken about tonight, the extinction vortex and everything this, this breed has gone through. Well, it hasn't gone through the extinction vortex, but their inbreeding is so bad. They've brought back this foal from 40 years ago, from a tissue sample 40 years ago to rebolster that breed. And this just shows how technology can work at its best. And I think it's really this just proof of concept that it really can work. So this is the lab that you saw downstairs where we're hoping to, to perform this. And it's obviously a, a tissue banking for preservation 
uh, of animal tissues. And how it works on the cloning side, the horse to be cloned, we usually uh, take uh, the ear sample of the, the animal's die um, and, um, and we can take out the, the, the genetics of that. We get the donor, the surrogate gives us an egg. We take out the nucleus of this egg, we replace it with the DNA of the horse to be cloned and by an electrical impulse, we can stimulate that egg to start reproducing and actually produce a, a clone of, of, the, of the cloned horse. And that's put back into a surrogate and hopefully 11 months later, um, uh, a foal pops out that's a full clone. So it, it's, uh, it's using science technology at, you know, uh, at its best. And, uh, and it's obviously, the beauty about this, it's not just the male side, we can do the female side, we can do female preservation uh, 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 as well on that side. So, you know, um, it's express tissue banking and we can maintain the DNA. And the next thing is to start growing cell lines. So at the moment, we just store the tissue samples. So the next thing is to actually, we send it all to America at the moment, but soon we're going to be able to grow cell lines here to show that those cells are able to reproduce in our lab downstairs. And then we can freeze that down and we know forever we can always reproduce that animal if, if need be. Uh, we looked at this on other sides and actually we said, well, what, if we can do that on other species, why can't we do it on you know, some of these really endangered species? I don't know whether everybody knows out there, it's World Rhino Day today. You know, as we know, there's only two uh, northern whites left in the world. Uh, and, you know, this is the iconic uh, breeds, obviously, for the black rhino. Sorry, it's a bit gruesome, this picture, but this is obviously a, a, a rhino that's come in. It died uh, a while ago, obviously. And we take that as tissue sample and frozen it down. So uh, the advantage, obviously, we can, we can keep the whole sort of genetic profile of that animal for future use. And this is what Adam Henson said. We, we're very lucky to have obviously country file here. And this is what he said about this. This is Mercus Jem. Remarkably, he's a clone of a horse called Jem Twist, who was renowned the world over for being one of the best show jumpers of all time. And he's a stallion, so he can breed. And depending on where your ethics lie, whether there's the willingness and the money, perhaps scientifically, this is another way of saving breeds from extinction. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of this, you know, obviously we know all this. We stand really on a pivotal time, really, at the moment with these rare breeds. And we've got to have a finer way of trying to using technology to preserve them. Um, so, um, yeah, so one of the things we are just finishing off on, we're actually starting up a, a charity called Nature Safe. Safe stands for saving animals from extinction. It's sort of like the living biobank. So... Um, this is something very new, uh, very close to my heart, and uh, we thought, well, if we can do it with, with the horses and, and that side of things, why can't we do it with other species? I don't know whether you've heard of the Millennium Seed Bank. Uh, this is like, you could say, the animal equivalent to the Millennium Seed Bank. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I said before, there's 25,000 species are going to disappear and uh, one million So we have to try and do something to try and save this. And obviously doing a biobank is one of those ways of doing it. So we're just about to establish this as really as it's uh, doing exactly what we spoke to or storing tissue balance for future generation. Yeah, just uh, sorry, just a few holiday snaps now. Just sort of doing uh, for anybody's interested. How do we collect semen off an elephant? I just uh, I went out to South Africa collecting in uh, in October. I was very fortunate in Palumas here inviting me out there. Our freezing extender again. And I'm not. I'm not it's not all because of the suffer, but I have to. I'll give a little bit of credit. But we've obviously had to make this extender up to some of these breeds that are more difficult to freeze, and we sent it out to it. And believe it or not, it freezes elephant semen, which is really good to know. So we went out there to help them. Just a few stats to give you. Uh, I've nearly finished. Don't worry. There were 10 million elephants at the early 20th century. There are 410,000 roughly left now, with 160,000 they reckon by 2025. They are literally disappearing in front of their eyes. They have the same issue as you do with the Suffolks. Their inbreeding uh, is a problem. And if we can store the samples and reintroduce a new line, it can really bolster this line up. Uh, uh, turn this down. This is just an elephant that we, uh, uh, we darted. And I was, they asked me if they come in the helicopter. We dart them, it takes about 10 minutes for them to drop. These are all wild elephants. Uh, there was a lake behind us actually so that this elephant was trying to get to the lake uh, and uh, I thought this thing was going to pull us straight this elephant to pull us straight out the 
helicopter. It was pretty nerve wracking, uh, but absolutely incredible. Uh, and uh, this is us working on it. Um, I must admit, um, I was holding an elephant's penis for about four hours a day. Uh, it sounds a bit weird, but it was the most amazing, amazing experience in my life. Um, uh, these amazing five ton, you think yours weigh a bit, these are five ton. You wouldn't want one of these standing on your feet. But being able to do your little bit for nature was just incredible. Uh, and they just literally gave it a reversal drug uh, after about 45 minutes of us working on the animal. And, uh, and it, it got up and walked away as if, well, I'm sure it knew something had happened. But anyway, it walked away as if nothing had happened. So uh, it was great to be a part of this team. Um, yeah, we don't want to dwell on those shots really too long. Um, but uh, so, yeah, and we've got the tissue sample from their ears and froze that down as well. So, right, I think I've taken up enough of your time. Um, that's me done for the night. I don't know whether there's any questions come in. Yeah, well, one or two questions. Um, yeah, Steph, do you want to come? Can I just, can you go off mute a second, Steph? Hi. Right. Uh, oh, I'll just end this, actually. Uh, is that is that ended me sharing it? Hold on. Um... Am I on screen now or not? No, we need to. Oh, hang on. Yeah, there we go. Is that yeah, better? It's perfect, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Great. Right, so I hope that's... Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we've, we've lost a few people, but not too... Oh, somebody's put... Jacqueline Ward's put superb evening. Thank you, Jacqueline. That's great. Right. Um, is there a time of year when a stallion semen is of poorer quar quality? Quality? How much have you been drinking tonight? <laughs> <Well>, have <laughs> you got gin in that water? <laughs> um, it's a time of year. It's a good question because, yes, we freeze a lot in the winter. It's a, it's a, in the summer, we tend to get larger volumes. And I have to admit, I slightly prefer freezing in the winter because you tend to get a lower volume, higher concentrated product. Um, Yes, you could see our native breeds are slightly more fertile in the summer because that's when they're naturally meant to be. But with the stallion side, I think sort of uh, September, October, November, and even December, it works very well. If it gets very, very cold, yes, it can tip off a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, from Alison and everybody, that's good. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and so, yes, the winter time is fine. We do a lot of freezing. I actually prefer the winter time because we get a different type of ejaculate from those stallions. We get a smaller volume, higher concentrated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question from Erica. Right. She has said, um, for the stallions that come on and off center regularly, um, but they don't, they're not collected from at home, do you see a difference in their semen quality and quantity when they come back each time? It varies, yes. I mean, the big thing with certain stallions, they need flushing out. So if they only come on one and they have a long period of sexual rest, the semen quality can drop off. So we do need to get them flushed out and, 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 and see, see, seeing how they, how they go on that. Um, so, oh, it's good. I can see you there, Andrew, now. <laughs> it's great this weather. Normally with the weather, I can't see people in front of me. So uh, it's great that I can actually see. So make sure you're not asleep. That's, that's, yeah, I just wake you up, haven't I? Yes. Anyway, sorry, yeah. who else was on, on there? Yeah. Um, so we've got Elaine Keith. She said that given your advances in your liquid gold, <laughs> is older semen from stallions past likely to give poorer results? So basically the question was on the stuff we froze years ago, is it not going to be as good as, as this? Uh, oh, uh, maybe yes or no. Basically, we always have a standard that we freeze to. So I think it's more the fact is, yes, it froze well years ago, uh, but we can make it freeze better now. So in other words, we may, we can freeze, I reckon if it's good enough quality semen, we can freeze 90% of stallions now. Whereas years ago, uh, we, may, uh, we may not be able to freeze uh, only about 70 or 80%. So those advances on the semen collection uh, are, are uh, you know, have, have really, really helped with, with some of those stallions. Um, uh, a question from Jules. She said, is it possible to extract oocytes from in foal mares in the same way you can from in calf cows during the first two to three mm. months? I have to admit, I have to pass on that one. I, I, I wish I'd do all the questions, but I've told Manda, I, it's a, I'm more on the stallion side. I don't know. All the mares that I see taking the oocytes off have been, that I know of, have been mares that have not been in foal. So I would... I would say not, but I'm, 
I don't know enough about that one. I, would, I can come back and find out. That's one thing I can do. I know a man who can. So yes, I can get back to you on that one. And one last question. After saying three-year-old Suffolk's are not great at collecting from, if, uh, if you're gelding one, would you still think it's worth taking? I think it's definitely, I mean, we're not, I mean, we could even do a two-year-old, but the percentages obviously drop off the younger they are. So uh, the question was, can we do a three-year-old? And does it, I think it's, if they're going to be castrated, one is you could send the testicles to us. That's one, one side of it. And yes, you could try as a three-year-old, but what we might be saying, and these are obviously rough figures now, and I haven't got any scientific behind them, but just my gut feeling, if we can freeze maybe uh, 70 to 80% or 70% of Suffolk's, it might be 50% as three or something like that. That's all it is. So it's not saying all three-year-olds will not freeze by any means at all. We have done some before, but generally they need to be, they've got more of a chance if they're older, if that makes sense. All right. So I think we're virtually wrapped up. We've gone on for, well, just shy of two hours. So I hope we haven't, we've kept, kept to hopefully kept the audience. Oh yeah, I think we have uh, pretty much. So uh, we lost about 10 people, I think. So, um, but so I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, a winner. We need a winner, Steph. Have you picked anybody out? You're on mute at the moment, by the way. Yeah. I, I'm just got, I'm going to do a no, random number generator and then I'm going to count along the people okay so yeah. my number is 17 let me just bring up the list so oh long as not my uncle from America <laughs> it's going to cost me a fortune to send it out there <laughs> I'm just going to check whether Andrew's still awake yeah yeah Andrew's still awake good yeah <laughs> it's Heather Gray Heather Gray I don't know whether, oh, and Catherine, you're watching from America. That's good to see you. God, we've, we've got a lot of international people tonight. Good. And you haven't fallen asleep either. It's quite good flicking through these people. I just seeing anybody else. Say, a lot of people haven't got their videos on, so I can't, I can't see whether they're asleep or not. But, uh, uh, sorry. Talis, can I, if you are rounding off, Talis, can I just thank you so much for giving up your evening? Fantastic, interesting, amusing great evening and one of many i hope thank you so much for giving up your time well i just have to say and i know i said it, i really thank you as the suffolk course i did obviously thank you what's the name of the lady she's born it heather gray. heather gray thank you heather gray for doing it well we'll just get it if you can send us your send uh, steph your details and then i can post our little goodie bag out to you but i really do mean it you the suffolk course has presented challenges i think we've got to be open about that and we've had to adapt to those challenges and I, i've loved loved doing that and uh and uh, uh so I, I i really do mean it from the bottom of my heart i really appreciate you giving us the opportunities to be able to use our science and technology on yourself to just help help this amazing breed so thank you very much thanks Talis. great good night thank you